So once you've established the diagnosis of decompression illness, the standard treatment we're going to give them is uh, what's called a US Navy Table 6. The first thing we need to do before we put the diver in the chamber is to obtain their consent to explain that the purpose of the treatment is to cure or at least ameliorate their decompression illness and then to inform them about the risks of complications that may occur. The most serious complication, which is relatively rare, is oxygen toxicity and neurological toxicity can occur when you're exposed to oxygen at pressures above sea level. And this usually manifests itself as a grand mal epileptic seizure. It's not turning the diver into an epileptic because it can't occur at pressures around sea level, only at high pressures. But there will be a nurse in the chamber with them to look after them if they do have this problem. And the diver obviously needs to be aware that it's about a 1% risk of it occurring with this particular treatment. The other oxygen toxicity that they may sustain is pulmonary oxygen toxicity. And this is more related to the total exposure of oxygen they occur. It can happen with this single treatment, but it's more common if they have more prolonged treatment or if they have repeated treatments. Uh, the manifestation of that is usually some retrosternal pain, perhaps a little bit of uh, burning behind the, behind the sternum, a dry cough, possibly some breathlessness, and if you undertake pulmonary function tests, you might find their FRC is reduced. This is largely reversible by making sure that the diver breathes air in between their treatments if they're having multiple treatments in the chamber and it will settle down of its own accord and can be treated symptomatically if necessary. More common complications which are less serious are barotrauma, of which problems with the ears are the most common. Now divers are used to clearing their ears when they dive, so they usually don't have an issue with this, but you need to discuss it with them and make sure that they do clear their ears with valsalva manoeuvres or, or such like as they go down and report any problems as they descend. You can rarely also get problems with uh, barotrauma to the sinuses or sometimes to uh, fillings in the teeth if there's gas trapped in there. There may be an issue with claustrophobia once they're shut in the chamber. Not usually with experienced divers, but if it's somebody who's just been diving for the first time and did find they were claustrophobic at depth and has sustained decompression illness, then it might be an issue as well. Once you've been through all the complications and uh, got their consent, uh, then you can proceed to the treatment. So the treatment that the diver is actually going to receive, they're going to be repressurized in the hyperbaric chamber. So we'll secure them in the chamber with a nurse to look after them and it will be taken down to a depth equivalent to 18 metres of seawater. The uh, diver will be at 2.8 atmospheres, absolute. Once they're at depth, they're going to receive cycles of oxygen, 100% oxygen via a hood. The idea of this is that the pressure itself that they're exposed to will compress the bubbles that are causing their decompression illness and thereby usually uh, produces almost instant relief of symptoms once you get to depth. By also giving them oxygen at that depth, what we're going to do is improve the oxygenation of the tissues that may have been impaired by the presence of the bubbles in the circulation and the tissues themselves. And also, we're going to reduce the amount of nitrogen in the patient's body and their circulation, which will encourage the nitrogen that's in the bubbles to diffuse out, travel to the lungs and be breathed out by the patient, so actually relieve their decompression sickness. They'll receive three cycles of oxygen at this 18 metre depth with a short air break between each one. The purpose of the air breaks is to reduce the risk of them getting an oxygen toxicity seizure. Because of the risk of regurgitation and aspiration if the diver does have an episode of neurological oxygen toxicity, it's important that they don't eat before they go in the chamber. They can have clear fluids orally and these should be encouraged because every single diver with decompression illness is significantly dehydrated. They've been exercising at depth, they won't have drunk during their dive and they may well not have received any fluids after their dive as well. In fact, if there is clinical signs of dehydration, we'll usually set up an intravenous drip as well. Once we're at the depth, we will assess the patient's symptoms and signs uh, with the assistance of the nurse in the chamber and see if they're improving. 
if they're not improving, then there's two possibilities. Either you've got the diagnosis wrong, which is quite possible because decompression and illness can impersonate all sorts of other conditions. So you need to review that. If you're confident of your diagnosis and they're not improving, then you have an option to what's called extend the table by giving two more cycles of oxygen at that depth. A standard US Navy Table 6 will take about five hours, but it will go to a little over seven hours if you extend it fully at both 18 and 9 metres. After their three cycles of oxygen, or their possible two extensions at that depth, you're then going to reduce the pressure to 9 metres of seawater, so 1.9 atmospheres, where they're going to receive further oxygen cycles. The oxygen cycles at this uh, pressure are longer, uh, and as are the air brakes. And we usually do two cycles of oxygen at this depth, and the air brakes for about 15 minutes, which gives the diver a chance to get some fluids and to have something to eat if they want. Once you've completed the oxygen cycles at nine meters of seawater, that will be either two or four cycles of oxygen, you cannot extend the table any further than that, and you need to slowly surface. The reason for that is that the nurse in the chamber has also been exposed to the same pressure and they need to decompress. And if you stay any longer at that depth, you will be in a saturation setting. Once you're at the surface, you'll bring the patient out of the chamber and formally reassess their signs and symptoms to see whether they've completely got better or whether they've got any residual uh, issues. They'll go to the ward uh, to be observed overnight at least because they can get a relapse or a recurrence of their decompression symptoms or even develop new symptoms. And if that happens, you will want to retreat them, either with another table six or with other modified uh, recompression tables. If they're still not improving, then what we would normally do in the case of a severe decompression illness is go into what's called saturation. A saturation dive, we will go to 30 metres of seawater, which is four atmospheres. We will replace the uh, nitrogen in the chamber with helium, so they'll be breathing a mixture of helium and oxygen, and give them cycles of 50% oxygen in helium at that depth to try and relieve their symptoms further. Saturation means that the diver's tissues become completely saturated with helium at that depth. And the idea there is we can give a much more prolonged treatment and the diver will be in there for several days uh, with two nurses. And once we've either reached a plateau or cured their symptoms, then we will very slowly ascend back to normal atmospheric pressure, which actually takes, well, usually around about 48 hours or even longer. So it's quite a major undertaking to go into saturation but can help to relieve the symptoms in the more severe cases.